let me start out by saying that there was no way, given what you've already heard, that we could cover the universe on, on carbon utilization. It's already a very dynamic space with lots of players. Uh, what we want to do is give you a nice sampling of, the, of what's happening and the opportunities. So in the panel today, we have a couple of companies that are at different stages in commercializing new technologies for utilization and developing new business models. We have a company that is uh, developing a very useful everyday product with CO2. And then we have an investor who is uh, investing in a whole range of companies in carbon utilization. And we're fortunate to have Elisa Ferguson, who will be the moderator. Um, she could have given one of these talks in her own right. Uh, she's a consultant to a number of Fortune 500 companies, widely recognized, not only in carbon utilization, but all sorts of things related to sustainability. She has been uh, recently playing a significant role with the XPRIZE uh, and the competition that's going on there. And so what I'll do is I will introduce Elisa, I'm, I'll have Elisa come up and then and, uh, she will introduce the, the other panelists and proceed from there. So if Elisa and the others would please come in, that'd be great. Thank you. pleasure to be here today uh, with uh, all the amazing folks in this room and with this excellent panel uh, with a number of perspectives on uh, what is the future of this emerging industry. Um, as Brad said, I'm Elisa Ferguson. I've spent most of my career uh, focused on uh, accelerating uh, clean energy innovation. Uh, back in 2013, I started working with the XPRIZE <coughs> Foundation to design a prize uh, that would help focus uh, attention on converting CO2 from a waste into an asset. That project became the NRG CAICIA Carbon X Prize. The prize launched uh, in the fall of 2015 and just recently in April of this year uh, announced the 10 finalist teams that will be building and demonstrating their technologies at two test centers. Uh, one uh, here in Wyoming uh, at the Integrated Test Center at a coal power plant, the Dry Fork Station in Gillette, and then uh, uh, additional finalists up at, uh, in Alberta at a natural gas power plant in Calgary. So uh, we have today a variety of perspectives on this uh, emerging industry, carbon utilization. Um, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll notice that it's a nascent industry, and so nascent, in fact, that we haven't yet all agreed on what to call it. <laughs> so <laughs> Matt Lucas talked uh, earlier today about carbon tech. Um, you know, I just said carbon utilization, some people say carbon recycling. Um, these are all um, you know, s s sort of the different terms for the same thing, which is basically recycling or reusing uh, carbon and CO2 and converting it into valuable products. Uh, these can be fuels, building materials, chemicals, um, and apparently, according to uh, Matt Lucas's slides, also vodka martinis. It seems very promising. <laughs> So uh, at XPRIZE, we don't see these newer technologies as uh, really in competition with the more mature technologies like CCS, EOR. Uh, we, we really, it's quite the contrary. Um, you know, Jonathan Pershing this morning um, made a great point, which is climate change is a huge issue. Um, it's really the definition of a grand challenge. It's big, it's complex, it's global, it crosses many industries, and it's not gonna be solved by any single technology solution. We're gonna need everything. And that includes technologies that are not yet commercial today. Um, so with that, um, oh, I also wanted to mention that uh, although in the Carbon X Prize, we're demonstrating the technologies at power plants, there's actually a number of uh, other applications uh, for these technologies that are quite promising. And particularly in the industrial sector, you saw a map earlier where some of those opportunities are distributed around the country. That's something that uh, we at XPRIZE are, are quite interested in as well, even though the prize itself will be focused on power plant emissions. Um, with that introduction, I'd like to turn to our excellent panel here. Um, everyone's gonna speak uh, here for about five minutes or so, and then we're gonna open it up um, for audience questions. So think about your questions, um, and uh, let's, let's start. I'd like to start with Natasha Cave. 
uh, who's the co-founder of Opus 12. Um, your company is the youngest company on this panel, <laughs> and in my view, at least, uh, one of the most exciting startups um, in the carbon space. And I hope you could tell us a little bit about your work and um, how your company fits into this emerging industry. Sure. So. Um Thank you for the introduction. Um, I am co-founder and uh, chief science officer, although I'm transitioning to become chief operating officer at Opus 12. And we basically take waste carbon dioxide and make products out of them. Um, and the inspiration for this company started in, in my, my childhood. I grew up in Houston, Texas, you know, surrounded by oil and gas. And so from a very early age, I knew the importance of oil and gas and, and building our city and our civilization. And I still see the importance in that and the role that it'll play in our future. But I also um, had an experience with waste from the oil and gas industry. So in the neighborhood that was adjacent to mine, there was a, a waste site that had leached into the water over the years and were linked to higher rates of uh, rare cancers and diseases. And so even though my family was not directly affected by that, I certainly was surrounded by, by this um, episode. And from then on, I wanted to do something about the waste that we generate from this important industry. So in graduate school, I worked on a technology that could take carbon dioxide and water and break apart the CO2 and water molecules into smaller atomic bits and then reform those bits into new molecules. And we specifically worked on metal catalysts that can do that with the help of electricity. So just imagine using uh, renewable electricity and, and a transition metal catalyst to make products like um, ethanol, which 10% of what you put in your car is ethanol. Uh, we can make a precursor to diesel fuel. We can make a precursor to plastic. And then we identified 16 new molecules that we can make um, from this technology. So t toward the end of my PhD, I teamed up with my colleagues at Stanford, and we uh, initially attracted some philanthropic funds, and eventually government grants. And now we are able to attract private funding to grow our company. And what we would like to do at scale is that we would take CO2, um, ideally from the air or from an emission source, and we can make these products that are already sold on the open market. And with, with cheap renewable electricity, we can do it um, in a cost competitive way, is the, is the vision. Right now, we're starting pretty small, so our first unit will convert about uh, 40 to 50 kilograms of CO2 per day. And that's going to be a commercial unit, so we can sell that, put it in the field, get test results and bring in revenue to the company as we start to scale up to the much larger scale where we're the, a plant the size of maybe Petronova and, and these types of larger <coughs> installations. Um, and in general, as, as was mentioned earlier, we see ourselves as a player in this field. We're definitely looking to work with and be complementary to other companies. So for example, Lanza Tech, we've um, started talking with them about how we can be complementary to provide our products that can then be taken by other companies and make even more products. So um, biochemical pathways can make a wider range of products and we can provide a feedstock that's uh, easier for the bacteria to, to use. So we're really excited about that, about to being sort of the back end or the, the uh, I like to call it the Levi genes of the carbon market where we can just be the, you know, be a provider for that. So happy to be here and take questions. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tasha. It's a great introduction to, to uh, this company and this panel. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Laurel Harmon from Lanza Tech. Uh, Lanza Tech was founded uh, more, a little more than a decade ago um, and, has, and has actually already successfully uh, commercialized uh, a number of pathways uh, to use carbon. Um, Laurel, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about uh, how your company got to where it is today and what you see uh, in the future uh, for your company and its industry. Sure. It's, I'm very happy to be here and it's really exciting to hear all of that's going on and, I, you know, I think we represent a lot of um, an array here up on the panel. So specifically, Lanzatech's background, uh, we were founded in 2005 and with the goal of using waste, waste carbon wherever it could be found. Um, waste carbon being viewed as a resource instead of a liability. And very specifically, it's interesting to hear the inspiration of the oil and gas industry. The company was founded in New Zealand and not far from a steel mill which gave this keen awareness that there's a whole lot of carbon being emitted necessarily, continuously from steel making. It's intrinsic to steel making. It will always be produced. And yet, if you are looking for a resource 
There it is, it's point sourced, it's accessible. And so the company went down the path of developing a biological process, a fermentation process that consumes waste emissions such as those from refining, from steel making, and converts that through the metabolism of our microbes into products. Um, and I'll talk about what those products are. But the first commercial pro product though, that we tackled was ethanol. And so the company now has gotten, you gave us a little more credit than I would want to take. We, our first commercial plant producing ethanol just started up this month in China, which is implemented, that plant is being, is built at a China, at a steel mill in China at the Shogang Group. So that is our first commercial pathway, just, just to be clear. And we have five, Total, a total of five commercial plants um, in various stages of development right now. Um, besides the Shogang plant, the second one is with ArcelorMittal in Belgium, again using steel making waste gases. We've announced a project with Indian Oil in uh, the Panicot refinery using refinery waste gases. And as well, a project in South Africa that will use ferroalloy gases, which are much more like steel making. And what I'd like to, to clarify that's a little different than some of what's been discussed today is we're effectively capturing gases before they are combusted and become CO2. So these gases, depending upon the manufacturing process, are rich in carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and they may well contain CO2. But we're, we're looking to get them right at the source before they're actually released into the atmosphere and before the full combustion if that's the form in which they come from the industry. So this, this process is a fermentation analogous to what you think of with sugar fermentation, except the microbes consume gas. It's a continuous process like a refining process. And just as in the petrochemical industry, you would modify catalysts to make different products from a single feedstock, we modify our microbe to produce different products from any given gas stream. And we actually like to think about this a little bit in, with the computer analogy where the, the actual fermentation system is the hardware and by dropping in a new microbe we can switch products. So we do have, we have demonstrated about 50 different direct fermentation products <coughs> from gases like these and they're in different stages in de development. But what that means is that we can produce molecules which will go into chemical supply chain, have potential in fuels, something like isopropyl alcohol, which can be dehydrated and go ultimately go into polypropylene. And even ethanol itself, we think of it, especially in the US, we think of ethanol strictly in its role as a fuel, but ethanol can also uh, become an intermediate in the chemical supply chain by producing ethylene. And we ourselves have developed a process with the Pacific Northwest National Lab to make jet fuel from our ethanol. We've demonstrated production of uh, 4,000 gallons of jet from ethanol that was produced either from waste gases or by comparison, conventional grain ethanol. And that has actually re recently re received the approval needed to be used in uh, commercial aviation. So just another example of how far you can go from what used to be just considered a waste. Great. Thank you, Laura. So um, now that you've heard uh, a, a little bit about the diversity of innovation um, that's happening in the space of <coughs> solutions, um, we're going to hear from kind of the other side of the equation, the customer side. Um, and uh, we have Aaron Mason from Interface. Interface is the world's largest manufacturer of modular carpet tile. Um, and I'm really interested to hear your perspective on um, how carbon utilization technologies intersect um, with supply chain, manufacturing supply chains, and also uh, what, uh, how companies like yours got involved and how maybe other companies um, in this room and elsewhere uh, could get involved in this space. Sure, thanks. Um, I mean, it starts for us at the end of 2016 I convinced our incoming CEO to make the next sustainability mission at Interface be reversing global warming. And so that's kind of how we got started. 
on this kind of new journey. And, and you know, it wasn't a hard commitment for him to make if you guys have heard of our company or not. We're an American billion dollar foreign manufacturer that have been on this journey throughout 25 years. So our company had already demonstrated through the work that our founder, Ray Anderson, did that we could adopt a new business <coughs> model that was much more focused on sustainable business. So we spent 25 years figuring out how to make our products have much less impact on the environment and really operate the business in that way. But this was a big shift for us. And you know, so it was this idea of, because we're a foreign company, how does that translate into strategy? Well, that means that we need to come up with a new model to run the business in a way that not only deeply reduces the carbon, but um, removes carbon and runs the business in a way that does that while protecting natural sinks. And so we challenged our innovation team to create a carpet tile that sequestered CO2 about a year ago. And what we really wanted them to do was start to enter the fray of understanding from the material, filler, and plastics perspective, because kind of those are the layers of some of our products, the fiber, the filler, and the plastic backings. How do we find those new raw materials that are made from CO2, that store CO2? How do we begin to build the supply chain what is it that we need to do? And you know, obviously, as we've talked about this morning, there's a huge amount of gaps there. So there's a lot of stuff that we've got in our business focused on doing. So every day, we kind of get up at Interface and say, OK, we've launched a prototype. What was really interesting about this carpet tile that we called Proof Positive was kind of it did two <coughs> things that I'm super excited about. The first is that it put a lot of fear into our competitors about what was coming and where the built environment needed to go which is, as a huge part of the problem, shifting that conversation in the built environment to carbon negative building materials from the ground up, thinking about what are the new supply chains we need to put in place, what are the new materials we need to specify. So that was a really great reaction to see that they were kind of freaking out. But the second really interesting thing was big brands who came to us and said, you know, we have a Skunk Works project that needs a carbon sequestering or negative material. Like, huge brands that we all would have heard of that make things from tennis shoes to jeans. And they were saying, you know, we don't have the supply chain. We don't have the protocol. Our marketing team doesn't know how to talk about this. We have a lot of sketchy people offering us materials, and they've never measured the impact of it. So there's just some really big gaps sort of once you get your company focused on this. So we kind of, my team gets up all day, every day, and we say, what is it that we can do, and what are we trying to do? And the first is, that was talked about this morning, you know, mindset change amongst other corporates, really getting companies to understand a climate strategy nowadays is not just about carbon reduction or reducing the carbon footprint of your products, it's about carbon removal goals and getting those built into the strategy. And I loved what Chris said this morning. I think my peers feel like many days they are dealing with a baby moose. Like their <laughs> CEOs are short-sighted and ill-tempered and they're really <laughs> having trouble. You know, making this <coughs> argument that we've got to shift the company's strategy beyond just carbon reduction. When there aren't a lot of examples, there aren't a lot of you know, products in the space that are available. So one thing we can do and are trying to do is really raise the conversation and the ambition amongst you know, all corporates. But the second is we're trying to invest in platforms, you know, things that we can help support to get this going. So we're really having interesting conversations with people like Nori. You know, how do we build a carbon removal credit trading platform that makes it as easy for corporates to buy carbon removal credits as it is to buy carbon offsets right now? So I think that's another thing kind of we can do in our sector. The second is we can make a commitment <coughs> to start integrating those types of materials from companies that we're seeing across all parts of our supply chain. And in order to do that, we've kind of got to bridge the gap that always exists between innovators and startups and new companies offering raw materials with really established companies who want certainty, who want life cycle assessments. They want to know how things are calculated. They want to understand what carbon negative means. Sometimes they want to invest and they want to have certainty around how are we going to market this? How are we going to sell this to customers? What's the interest? So I think we can bridge the gap in sort of giving confidence to other companies, but maybe even looking at more formal things like buyers groups and establishing protocols. Um, and so I think you know that's kind of the exciting journey we've been on over a year and a half, waking up every day saying we got to get 
5,500 people in this company focused on reversing global warming, and that's what we're focused on doing. Awesome. Great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Aaron. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned Nori. I think um, anyone who doesn't know them can, can you know, Google them, uh, look them up. They're doing some really interesting work. They also have a great <coughs> podcast. Yeah, if you're like a podcast nerd like I am, and <laughs> you travel a lot, you need things to listen to, um, it's, it's really, really great. Um, there are people in this room who have actually been on the podcast. So. <laughs> um, well, thanks so much, Aaron. Um, finally, we'll, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Mike Biddle with Evoke Innovations, uh, which is a clean tech fund um, focused in this space. Um, really interested to hear uh, more about your unique uh, approach to these investments and your model. Um, as well as how you see kind of the broader <laughs> investment, um, you know, for these technologies uh, going forward. Right, um, and I, I didn't know what to expect from my previous panelists, so <laughs> I'm going to start my my discussion a little bit differently because I I heard a common theme that resonates with me, and that was a, around waste, whether it's in the the production cycle, the use cycle, the supply chain, and all of you got to where you are today partly by tackling waste, and my story is similar. Uh, about 25 years ago, I, I started a clean tech, hard tech company um, after spending my sort of act one working for large industrial companies like Dow, GE, and Cummins Engine, and tired of the short-term moose-like behavior, <laughs> uh, not being able to look at the long term. And I decided to create a company that focused on taking waste and turning it into something valuable. Uh, that idea started in my garage in California. I raised $150 million over the next uh, 10 or 15 years and grew it to a multinational. We had a we had an exit a little while back. Uh, so during that process, I watched the evolution. I think part of the reason I'm here on this panel is because where's the, where are the investors and where are the investors in the room? I think there's only a few of us here at this conference and I unfortunately see that frequently. Um, so we saw this gap and during my journey, I started before clean tech was a word and in fact, when I started making the presentation of what I wanted to do with my company, uh, I was billed as an environmental company, which to an investor meant, oh, you're going to lose my money. <laughs> uh, and then I read, rode the, the clean tech bubble as it started to grow and started to grow, and then money became easier, and then I watched the clean tech bubble Im explode or implode, and watched those big name investors who had bet, made big bets on clean tech 1.0, lost a lot of money, and have mostly stayed away. So there's been this gap at early stage clean tech, hard tech companies. And I saw that happening during the, the end of my, my journey with my own startup and started working with startups in the clean tech, hard tech space, trying to solve for that, that very problem. And was lucky enough uh, that my founder uh, about two years ago, or my partner, uh, Marty Reed, found me about two years ago, knew I was looking to do something new and asked me to help him build Evoke Innovations out. So we're, we're about a little over a two-year-old fund. We're focused on clean energy. Um, we both journey through the clean tech, hard tech space, both as investors and as entrepreneurs. So we saw the same problem. And Evoke is meant to solve for some of the problems uh, and learn from the learnings that those early stage clean tech 1.0 investors learn from and the clean tech 1.0 entrepreneurs learn from. And one of the things we're trying to break with our fund is that most uh, VC funds, most venture funds are focused on uh, or have a 10 year time frame. In other words, they get their money from their LPs, their limited partners who give them the money to invest. Within 10 years, they need to return that money with hopefully a lot more of that money back to their, their investors if they want to be successful and, and do another fund. Uh, we said that doesn't work in hard tech. Hard tech sometimes takes longer. Even though we want it to happen faster, it takes longer. So uh, we managed to get our funders to agree to having the fund be an evergreen fund. So we have no time limit. We, we, we work very hard to have our investments return, you know, be successful in a short time period, but we don't have this outside artificial pressure from our investors to return money back to them. In fact, when we have a successful exit, it goes back into the fund, grows the fund, so we can make more investments in the same space. The second thing we broke is most, and this frustrated the heck out of me when I was raising money, most of my investors really didn't know what it took to run a hard tech company and how hard it is and all the, the nuts and bolts that you have to, all the devil and the details that you have to overcome to make a clean tech successful. So both Marty and I have done it, and we've got lots of battle scars, and hopefully we've learned a little bit from those battle scars and are able to bring that to the companies we invest in and not just money. So we spend a great deal of time with the, with the companies that want us to spend time with them. We use our networks. I have over 15,000 people in the clean tech space worldwide that I developed over the last 25 years. So we work really close with our investments. We're not 
we're hands off if they want us to be hand off, but we're fully in if they want us to be fully in. And I'll just wrap up with some, you can look at, you can look us up on, on the webpage to learn more about our fund. We're funded by two oil and gas companies, interestingly enough, and we're looking, we're probably gonna be raising money from another oil and gas company. There are two Canadian companies, uh, Synovus and Suncor, who get it, who get that the energy future is gonna be different than what it is today, and they wanna make sure that they're well prepared. And in fact, we can't make investments unless we can show an environmental impact. And that environmental impact usually comes in the flavor of greenhouse gas reductions, greenhouse gas avoidance, or greenhouse, uh, negative greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, two examples in that space, both out of Berkeley, uh, one is mosaic materials, which has a super absorbent for CO2, and another one is uh, Opus 12. We're very proud to be uh, an investor in, in Opus. And all of our other investments, even if they're not directly in the carbon capture and carbon to value space, they have a carbon story associated with them, or we really can't invest in them. So efficiency plays and so forth. Um, and I, I would just say the other thing is we, that differentiates us from many of the venture world is we go a very early stage. We've, we've actually created two companies out of our fund. We saw a great idea in a university. We created companies around those ideas. We do seed funding in Series A, and, and we're building out a capability to go later stage as well. And we cooperate with some of the biggest funds. In fact, Quartz was nice enough to write an article last week about one of our recent investments in an energy storage space alongside Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, so I think my time's up, so great. hopefully we have some good questions from the audience. Yeah, thanks, thanks Mike, that, that was great. Um, so hopefully that um, puts a little more meat on the bone in terms of what's going on in the space. Um, in just a minute, we're gonna turn to audience questions. I think we're gonna have someone with a microphone. Um, but uh, before we do that, so think about your questions for a minute. Um, I, I thought I would just sort of start with one uh, question. So, so the uh, Carbon X Prize is a $20 million competition where teams are uh, competing to convert the most CO2 into uh, valuable products. And when we were designing it, it's really both of those sides of the uh, coin were, were quite important. So obviously the technologies had to be proven to work and demonstrated uh, from a technical perspective. Um, and we wanted to uh, incentivize um, technologies that were able to uh, convert uh, a large amount of CO2. But also on the other side, the valuable product side is also important. Um, economics really matter in this space. Um, and these are uh, inherently, as any hard tech is, sort of capital intensive, uh, particularly at the beginning. Um, cost is always a question um, when you're talking about emerging technologies. Um, and so we wanted to be sure that we were also incentivizing uh, technologies that were going to uh, create value um, through these products. I wonder for just anyone on the panel if you could maybe give a little perspective um, on uh, the economics and value creation potential um, for kind of this carbon utilization space. You can speak to you know, about your own company if you'd like or just kind of uh, the broader economics. Um, I think that would be a, 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 a good way to kind of start out um, this discussion with the audience. So and anyone who'd like to jump in. Sure, I mean, you know, one of the things we had to do early on was convince our CEO kind of of the business opportunity. I mean, once we got over the, is this solvable conversation, which is the other psychological bit you always have, right? Which is that we've spent, you know, the better part of the last three decades con trying to convince people this is a huge global issue to the point where it's paralyzing sometimes. So once we get over that, you know, and we have this conversation about what's the value to the business, we tried to paint a picture of, look, if we're able to create what we would call, and, and we haven't settled on the term, whether it's a carbon negative product or a climate positive product, <laughs> but, I, but I think we understand that the materials in all part of the product, essentially when they're added up, um, avoid more or store more CO2 than the entire life cycle taken to make it. So if we kind of hold that in our mindset, name aside, you know, we were able to convince him, look, there's economic opportunity here because there are large customers of ours, like the Googles, like Kaiser, like companies like that, that really want to put these products in their offices as part of their commitment. So if we can tell you on our 10 largest global accounts, if we lock that in and become their exclusive supplier, there's $15 million. If we can tell you there's five design firms that we work with that are already working with companies, buildings, to build out carbon negative spaces. That's another you know, $20 million. So we literally went through our global account structure and said if we're able to offer this, we actually think here's what we think the benefit will be in sales. 
we might be exactly wrong, we might be exactly right, but it's been really interesting to see the market interest in our prototype, and that leads us to believe that we're partly right. Yeah, I'd like to, because I think that touches on something that I, I was mentioning in my opening remarks. Uh, one of the biggest problems for a startup entrepreneur in this space, uh, hard tech, clean tech, clean energy space, particularly the carbon space with no price on carbon, is how do you how are you going to show an investor you're going to make money, right? And how are you going to show that you're going to do it on a large scale, particularly if you need to raise large amounts of money? So, and that's part of what was broken with the old VC model, in our opinion. So we actually work really closely, and we push our entrepreneurs really hard to find that, that safe beachhead, that small beachhead where A, it's, it's not gonna break, it's not gonna cost a fortune to get there. It's not going to be insurmountable when you have your failure, not if you have your failures. You're gonna learn on a small scale what your failures are instead of learning on a catastrophic scale what your failures are. Uh, and I think that's what happened with a lot of the clean tech 1.0, hundreds of million dollars investments in technology that hadn't been kind of worked out at that smaller scale yet. And I think Opus 12 is a great example of, of doing exactly that. I mean, the CO2 you talked about capturing is a small number. It's not solving the problem day one that we want to solve, but it's brilliant that they're going down a small path first, figure out what doesn't work before raising too much money and having spectacular failures that you can't recover from. And that's always been a tension. And when you're an entrepreneur, you oh yeah, this is the dragon we're gonna slay, so give us lots of money and give us a high valuation. There's that, always that tension, and the investors bring it on themselves because that's what they're looking for, particularly if they have a short-term focus. So we're trying yeah. to fix that. We call it the last mover advantage that we had to be able to see <laughs> that it was clearly not gonna work to go to the large scale. That was a lesson we had to learn too by yeah. seeing other companies that went down that path. So I would certainly say if, we, if we're thinking about cost, there's cost on two sides of this. There's the investment cost. I mean, to build things at scale is a significant investment. We're a technology licensing company, and so what's, what, what, what's worked for us is then to be able to engage with companies that have the balance sheet to support plans, but only after we've gone through a systematic scale up process. It's not an accident that the first commercial plant is in 2018, although the idea was in 2005. It takes patient capital, it takes patient partners. We had partners who themselves were willing to fund mid-range pre-commercial demonstrations so that we had the confidence when it came to doing this full scale. So that's kind of the, the investment side. But if you want to look at the long-term sustainable economics, it, the question is, how do you produce products in a way that's competitive or either with incumbent product or when combined with whatever incentives or you know, carbon credits, whatever, in the environment that they are economically sustainable long term. And so that takes a couple of things at a minimum. It takes driving down on the technology improvement. The first is never the best. Driving down that cost curve, increasing the efficiency of plants, and it also takes building out a sustained market and so that you get the, the economies of scale and roll out. And it takes, a, it takes a real, one of the things I think it was highlighted but, or in, embedded but maybe not highlighted is the things we're talking about are very complex supply chains and it requires parties all along that supply chain to be successful and to achieve the economics that will allow this to be a long-term success. Well, and to add to that too, I mean, we haven't talked about kind of policy and regulation, how helpful that can be. I mean, um, you know, Evoke comes out of the Canadian oil and gas companies who are feeling some regulatory pressure in Canada and, and you know, having the 45Q law available, you know, that you know, even though we're still small, we're going after kind of our beachhead market, um, doesn't necessarily, won't necessarily directly benefit from 45Q, but having other investors who know that you know, as we start to scale, there'll be some incentive for companies to do something with their CO2, and companies take note of that, and so that, that helps us also get started and bring interest down to the to early stage companies. So. Great, thanks for all of that. Um, lots of opportunities, some challenges too. Um, so uh, let's turn to the audience uh, for questions. 
And I think there's a, do we have just one mic or is it, do we have two? Okay, um, let's start here. And if you could uh, just say um, who you are in your organization um, when you ask your question, that'd be great. Well, first of all, thanks. This is a very informative and, and interesting panel. My name is Charles Hernick and I'm with an organization called Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. Uh, and I'm the policy guy, so I've never made widgets in my life. So to hear some of this is, is good. And um, Aaron, one of the things that you mentioned was a, a carbon removal trading platform, and that that's something that you'd be looking into. And when I first started tracking carbon capture storage 10 years ago and helped EPA develop um, you know, the framework for, for geologic sequestration, um, a lot of this was viewed that there'd be a need for carbon offsets. And in fact, in compliance programs with Reggie in California, you've seen limited use of the offset program, um, but on the voluntary side of the equation for terrestrial offsets, you've seen a lot. Now, 45Q might change the game for geologic, but for you all, you're selling products. Do you anticipate that you can command a premium price for those products because they're carbon negative or climate positive? Um, or do you view uh, some need to engage with, I don't know, offsets you know, in, in the way that it's, it's uh, coming up through your products? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, I think what's interesting about what Nori is doing is it's kind of bringing together not just creating a platform for carbon removal credits versus avoidance, but it's doing it through blockchain, which I think will get past a lot of the criticism of the voluntary offset market around credibility. So let me just say that, and that's like the extent of my expertise um, <laughs> on Nori, but I would say check them out. But I mean, how we think about it is, we specifically don't want to offer these products at a price premium, because that to me is a really short term kind of economic gain for the company, but if the mission is really about pushing the built environment space forward, pushing competitors, and ultimately solving this challenge, we actually want to keep it at price parity for what the existing products are. So actually just last week we announced that all of our products around the world, whatever we make and sell is carbon neutral, standard attribute, no extra cost. And we actually think that the impact of that is gonna force our competitors to do the same thing. So what we're finding in terms of price right now is because this is such a new conversation when we did the prototype, um, the price uncertainty from the people who are offering us the materials is extremely high right now. So when we say something like, what could we expect this raw material cost to be in a three and five year horizon? They're like, we have no idea. Um, or they kind of try to project confidence and give us a number, but it's pretty clear that they have no idea. So I think a lot more kind of certainty <laughs> needs to really happen there before we talk about taking this across all products, across everywhere you know, and doing that, but, but how we want to get the advantage is if we're not going to get it on price, what we've found is that we get it because we're first. And so when we can go to a company like um, a large customer of ours globally is Salesforce, and we can actually say the attributes in this product, which are about a carbon negative third party verified approach, and what that's going to do to drive to solve the problem, the attractiveness of that component is that they give us their global business. And you know we try really hard to then build in specifications in the built environment space, either hard specifications, like every design firm we work with on a global hotel project builds in carbon negative carpet or flooring, or on kind of a softer space, which is really pushing standards like LEED to sort of acknowledge that as an innovation point, make it the standard. So that's where we try to get the advantage. And we've been successful in navigating that. How do we try to save the world, but still make money and not give everything away? And that's how we've done it. Through that specification business, through sort of being seen as a leader, asking those global accounts to be um, sole source. And we've actually been really successful over the last few months in getting universities to adopt us as a sole source provider for the first time ever because of the climate commitment in the products. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Akshat Radhi. I'm a reporter for Quartz. Um, question for Alisa. Um, in the, I, I wrote a series on carbon capture last year, and uh, among in, in doing that, as I talked to a number of startups, 
uh, Opus 12 is one of them. Um, some of them dropped out of the Carbon X Prize uh, for a number of reasons. They had differing reasons. A question for you is, you know, it's very hard to design prizes. If you were to design one now, what would you do, do differently for yeah. Carbon X Prize? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, thank you so much. I love course, by the way. I read it every morning. <laughs> um, so um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, there's kind of a joke um, around X Prize that once a prize launches, um, they want to make T-shirts that say, "Who designed this prize?" <laughs> um, and yeah, that's me. So um, I tell people, if, if you don't like the prize, it's probably my fault. Um, yeah, I, I think um, to be honest, uh, we had so a lot of prizes are, are prizes are intended to be designed under kind of um, you know kind of X Prize you know programs to be designed over the course of, you know, between six months and a year. Um, this prize, for a bunch of different reasons, um, actually we spent uh, over two years on the design. Um, and I think actually it really benefited from that because we were able to do um, quite a bit of in-depth analysis around um, the potential for the technologies. I mean, we did analysis using, um, you know, around thermodynamics of, of some of the technologies, um, you know, running different scenarios, um, trying to figure out you know, what we thought were some of the most promising products that could come out of the space, and by that I mean both from an environmental perspective as well as an economic perspective, thinking about sort of market size and things like that. So that's all kind of integrated into the scoring. We, we did some really detailed math. I, I didn't do the math. I'm not a math person. I'm a words person. But, um, you know, we did some detailed math around kind of how the, the, the scoring would occur. So, I mean, I would say that um, there honestly isn't a lot I would do differently, but I think that um, in terms of the actual kind of design and, and scoring and all that, I think that one of the biggest challenges that, that teams face, including in the Carbon X Prize, but really in any X Prize, um, is uh, access to uh, the capital to fund their participation. So the X Prize Foundation um, does not make grants. <laughs> uh, we don't have money available <laughs> that we just sort of give out. Um, it's uh, you know, it's an incentive prize, so really teams don't get money um, or win money until they've proven, um, you know, uh, what they, you know, what we've asked them to prove. And uh, it's just really challenging. Um, you know, a lot of the teams come out of universities, they're startups, sometimes they're individuals, they're, they're actual, like, garage tinkerers, and um, it's just really challenging. They don't necessarily know people in the ecosystem who are going to fund, um, you know, who are going to, you know, understand them and fund them. Um, and, and so, you know, we've tried to um, think creatively about how to match up, you know, the, the teams with potential investors. Um, we held, uh, as part of the Carbon X Prize, an investor summit last year. We brought, um, you know, the, the teams together with uh, a whole slew of investors. But it's, it's really challenging. And I, and I would say that um, if there was something kind of um, that I'd want to kind of maybe think more about during the design process is how we could integrate some of those um, kind of creative mechanisms to ensure that you know any any team that you know wants to be in the competition and you know has kind of shown you know the results um, that that make them competitive in the competition you know are able to stay in um, you know that we don't want teams to drop out because um, they don't have the money to sort of continue. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I mean for for us it was a, a very bittersweet uh, decision to to. Uh, not do it, but it just, for us, the scale that the demonstration had to be on was one level above what we wanted to start at, and the good thing that came out of it is that we, we uh, were able to talk with some uh, Canadian companies who were doing capture and could kind of map out what that uh, would look like at that scale, so we have really good pricing data for when we scale up, we have um, a built network that came out of leveraging the use of the XPRIZE. Um, so even though we ultimately realized that it just would take too much of our team's time to go after the specific uh, demo at that scale, uh, it was still very, very uh, helpful and useful for us to, to uh, investigate that path. And there's also the opportunity later on we could team up with a team that is uh, moving on and, and um, if, if they, there's some good synergy and good fit, um, when they do the next demonstration, um, we could partner with, with another team. So. Um, there's still more to come, I would say. For yeah, and, and that's a good point. We, you know, we, we think of, you know, the teams, our partners, um, you know, sponsors, you know, all, all the folks that we work with to kind of make the prize happen as kind of a family. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do keep in touch with them and, and try to, um, you know, pr uh, create opportunities for collaboration, um, 
you know, even for folks who aren't sort of formally within a Kaiser family. So. Um, questions, right here. This might be sort of an unfair question. Thank you for a great panel, by the way. Uh, I'm wondering if you all could identify one thing that you think would accelerate the emergence of this new carbon economy. What would that be? I mean, you, you said it's so nascent that you haven't even agreed on We haven't agreed on what to call it yet. So, so you can't say, come up with a name. That's you know, disallowing that is the answer. <laughs> Fair enough. But what, what one other thing besides arriving on a name? Uh, I'll take the easiest one, but it's also the most obvious, and we all know it. It's a price on carbon. It's, it's, it's low cost accounting. It's really paying. There is a price for carbon. We should be paying for it. We should be recognizing it. And once we do that, everything else, my job becomes easier, all of their jobs become easier, everything else falls into place. I'm a big believer in the free market system that the data in is real data and that they're working with instead of garbage in. Let's, let's get real data in. Let's get all the full costs accounted for and decisions will make themselves very quickly. I think in the built environment space, and it's probably true for other companies making products, is a tool to really assess and define carbon negative and then the platform to connect to making that. So for example, our prototype tells us we probably wouldn't have to buy carbon removal credits to make a carbon negative product. We can get it out of the raw materials if we find them, but other companies will. And so finding a way to link up the work, let's say of the University of Washington Smart Carbon Building Initiative, a low embodied carbon tool for architects and designers that ultimately says, if you're gonna undertake a retrofit or a new project, this is how you can literally assess the cement, the glass, the footprint, the interiors. These are the best choices you can make, and it's very well defined. That would greatly accelerate what we see as a lot of interest in the built environment space, but, it, but a way that people can't solve it yet. <coughs> Wonderful ideas. So let me add something <laughs> on a different axis here. Um, you know, there, it took quite some time and bio created sort of its own aura. And there is a broad public view, at least in, in many circles, that bio is good. I think this industry, the idea that we're recycling carbon, connecting that to the notion people already have about recycling glass and recycling steel, saying, oh my, this is a virtue, this is an advantage, and getting that pull and acceptance across the community and having that as well reflected in, in regulation, I think would be massive. I mean, I would say for us, you know, we spend um, a non-trivial amount of our time uh, seeking funding. We, you know, we still apply for as many government grants as we can get. Um, and of course, there's also private funding that, um, you know, we, we try to bring in as well. So, I mean, if there were um, ways to attract funding, um, ideally, we'd love to get it through just a grant or so it's not taking equity, but like have some funding that we can use. I and mean, we can certainly grow our team and, um, you know, attract top talent and be able to, build our systems much faster and quicker. Um, I mean, so, so you know, with this new tax bill, there's supposed to be all this money that's repatriated back to the states and that, that'll be taxed. I mean, if, if some of that money could maybe just be given to us as, as our, our company, we'd totally take and be happy and like, <laughs> we could avoid taxes. We don't have to do that. So if you know anybody, we pay for any funds, we, we, can, we can do that. So I mean, I, I do think it, it's ultimately, it's kind of a tragedy of the commons to have CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's kind of like the, you know, communal effort that needs to kind of help fund it, and so that's that. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, hi, Julio. I wanted to ask you guys about procurements and whether or not some kind of state or government or corporate procurements would accelerate your time to market or get you down the cost curve quicker. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if um, so if we could get pre-orders for our commercial unit, which Target uh, early next year will be our first commercial unit. It'd be about the size of a dishwasher. That's the 40 to 50 kilograms of CO2 per day. So yeah, if we could get, you know, like the, if the military bought some for use or, you know, save federal governments, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I think procurement uh, is fertile ground. It's 
fa it can be faster than policy, which is, is horribly slow and difficult and usually doesn't really hit the target you initially aim for. Um, and I think you spoke to, to having customers yeah. demanding or wanting to see some green certification. And, and so I actually, I was on the board of the Green Electronics Council driving a lead-like standard in the electronics industry to provide a pull for environmentally sound materials and, and cleaning up the supply chain and found that very effective in changing behaviors of manufacturers and looking for materials that had low carbon qualities and so forth. So I think the, the lead standard, the, what's called the EPEAT standard in the electronics yeah. industry, standards like that can, can drive behavior sometimes faster than a policy can. Absolutely, it just takes forever, right? I mean, if you look at trying to forever in our horizon of like get something built into a lead credit, um, it's a path we're working on and, and, and something we definitely wanna do, but we found it faster to go to some of those large global accounts that we have that align with specifically a climate commitment, you know, large banks, um, and, and actually say, hey, if we could actually do all your offices everywhere in the world, here's the quantification of what this means. We've been a little more successful in accelerating that conversation because I think we have it at every state level. We try to talk about building it into lead and it, it's taking longer than it should. And part of it is because if you go ask a state purchasing director what it means to buy something that's carbon negative, they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So we really have to accelerate the conversation of those stories. And I know there's a filmmaker here, but that is a huge, you raise it, it is this idea of what does the future look like? How do we define this? And is it a really good thing for my company, my institution, and my state to do? And so how do I do it? We need like that simple language out there so that we can kind of move past that conversation. I think that's great. And actually I think you know, partly that might be maybe my answer to the question of what's the one thing. Um, you know, I think uh, um, uh, customers <laughs> is sort of the answer. And you know, Aaron, Aaron you mentioned um, you know, maybe uh, the creation of a buyer's group. I do some work on renewable um, energy as well. And there uh, has been the emergence in the last few years of um, a renewable uh, renewable customer, uh, renewable buyers group. Um, a lot of them are companies that have committed to um, being 100% renewable in terms of their electricity. Um, you know, I think something like that in this carbon space um, could be very powerful. Yes. Hi, I'm Judy Greenwald with Greenwald Consulting. I have a question for Mike. You're exactly the kind of investor that we really need in this space, actually probably in a lot of spaces. How can we get more <coughs> investors to think and act like you? It's a, I, I, wish, I wish there were more investors. It's, it, we're in such a, a uncrowded space. Uh, a lot of investors sometimes don't want to see other investors in their space, but our space is so uncrowded I, I wish I knew the easy answer to that. There is no easy answer. And I think part of it is because uh, the number one thing I laid out, that evergreen notion, or at least more patient capital. So I, I alluded to breakthrough energy venture. So, so the, let me back up just a little bit. So what I saw happening when the big investors that lost all the money in the clean tech 1.0 space kind of backed out of that space for the most part and have stayed out. The good thing that happened was I saw uh, strategic start to backfill that space more than they had previously into the clean tech space. I think that's a good sign. You have to be careful that strategic's really aligned with you if you take them on too early. That's, you know, I could go on for hours about my thoughts about that, but they play a vital role in this whole ecosystem. And as we know, family offices and, and rich people, right? So uh, Bill Gates assembled uh, 20 or so billionaires and created uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and they are now making investments. Uh, I, I alluded to one which is now public, uh, thanks to Quartz, uh, last week. So there, that's a billion dollar plus fund. We're a hundred million dollar fund hoping to grow to about 250 million. We're not gonna get to a billion, I don't think. <laughs> uh, but they, they are, I don't think they view themselves as, a, as an evergreen fund, but they have a 20 year time horizon, which is very unique. So they have a big number, a lot of capital, and they have a long time horizon. Uh, another group that's uh, somewhat represented here, OGCI. So that's a group of uh, mostly European uh, and Middle East and, and a, maybe one US oil and gas company. I, I guess I don't know the whole population. Someone can speak to that. Um, oil and gas companies come together, put a million dollars towards climate change. They're going after methane emissions as their first target and, and hopefully CO2 emissions number two, I think. Um, 
So these are great signs, because that's big dollars. And that's what these companies, these startups need, is investors like that, that are patient and have lots of dollars to deploy, not just in, not in, just in the early stage, but it, that can follow on. And then to get it to a point where strategics can then help take the company and, and turn it into that large scale operation with the low cost uh, that you get with the uh, low, low cost uh, due to scale. So that's how we see it happening. And, and there's still this little window where we play, which is very early stage. BEV is actually making some bets in the very, very early stage. Um, but there's still very few wanting to take those really early bets that, that we make. Because it's, it's risky. It's, it's hard. I'll, I'll put a plug in as well. Um, we have a new program that we're funding through the CarMax Rise called the um, Circular Carbon Network, um, which is uh, intend to be sort of a conversation among investors who are interested in the space. It, it spans you know, VCs, uh, strategic corporates, um, family offices, uh, a number of folks. And um, it's starting out with, I think, just a, um, a small group that is getting together on a regular basis to have a conversation um, on the phone or in person. And then um, eventually we hope to grow it into more of a, a database where um, there can just be more information sharing about um, investment opportunities, what deals have, have been done or are being considered, things like that. So it's a, it's a small step. There's a lot to do, um, but that's one thing that, that we're doing. Um, Jeff, you have a question. Oh, yeah, and Jeff from Stanford Business School. Just I wanted to ask uh, Laurel and Natosha and Aaron why you guys have the big pulpit up there. Could you just explain in simple terms how is it that your companies at scale create climate benefit? In other words, you know, some companies do it by grabbing CO2 and making something that avoids, say, me digging CO2, you know, carbon up from underground. Other companies do it by sticking carbon into a product that stays put. And maybe if you could just kind of run through what the climate benefit of what you're doing in simple terms, or simple mind. <laughs> sure, so we actually do both, or we can do both of those scenarios that you mentioned. So in the case of making diesel fuel, um, we would be taking CO2, ideally from the air or from an emission source, and uh, using renewable electricity, so no carbon electricity, and converting that into diesel fuel. So it's now, instead of having to dig up diesel fuel, you can just use the diesel fuel that basically came from the air. In the case of a plastic, you would be, again, taking CO2 from the air, using renewable electricity, and making that plastic, and that plastic would either be recycled or it would um, eventually um, you know, end up in a landfill, but it would be sequestered in that, in that landfill and be CO2 negative. So if we're in the same boat, in the sense that we're taking carbon that would otherwise be emitted, turning it either into a fuel, in which case it's displacing the production of the extraction of new um, petroleum, or into durable goods, which then are, you can consider a form of sequestration. And so on the company side, you know, we've spent 20 years doing the, how do we deeply reduce the footprint at the company? So industrial efficiency, manufacturing efficiency, use of renewables, right? Just be less bad. Um, reduce the carbon impact of the products and the footprint. We've reduced the CO2 footprint of our products by about 60% working in our supply chain, getting them to be more efficient, getting them to buy renewables. Now the shift is sort of how do we make that essentially <coughs> carbon negative? So how do we calculate both the entire impact of our business, but because we're a company that makes products, what's really the entire impact of that product as it relates to CO2 and make that negative? So some of the ways that we're gonna do that are by using the materials that they're making um, and shifting from the materials we have now to using those materials. One of the big challenges is we wanna make sure we get those back at the end of life so that they don't go into actually a landfill. Um, and that's a big challenge for us in the easier challenge in the built environment space, but still a challenge. Um, so we're gonna shift our materials that we use to make products to be those materials but then we're also looking a bit at what can we do at our manufacturing plants around the world and how can we shift the mindset from being a low carbon footprint factory to one that actually sequesters CO2. So maybe that's, you know, not now direct air capture because <laughs> we can't afford it. But in the coming years, maybe there's a technology or a process that we can use 
at our manufacturing plants that's doing that, but we're also looking at things like terrestrial sequestration opportunities. What can we do on those sites that often have a huge amount of grass? What can we do in the office parks? What can we do of any scale to actually sequester CO2 around the factory spaces? So that's our very early thinking. Um, and the idea is for us to get to scale, I mean, we only have nine manufacturing plants around the world and whatever we acquire and whatever is in our supply chain, it's a drop in the bucket, we get it. But the idea is starting to set that bar and that target to shift the industry, to shift other companies and to start to have that conversation. So if we can do sequestration at a plant in Northern Ireland, so can the other 15 manufacturers that are in that office park, so can the state, so can the local government, that's kind of the trajectory and how we think about scale. Oh, I hope it's good. <laughs> so I want to build a little bit on Julio's question earlier about corporate procurement and go a little bit earlier in the development stage. So this is probably mostly for Atosha and Mike, but you know, we heard from Matt earlier about the idea of a virtual incubator for carbon technologies. And there's been a lot of movement at some of the national labs around creating more physical actual incubators like Cyclotron Road and sort of the clones of that in Argonne and, and, and Oak Ridge. Um, and I would sort of put Melissa's project and the Xpress project into that kind of incubator pathway. But so I, I wonder, particularly for, for Mike and Atosha, how, how do you think about what incubators or other accelerators could do to, to take technologies from lab to market? Have you benefited from one of those? Have several of your investments benefited from them? And if that was to be greatly scaled up in some way, either through private philanthropy or strategic corporates or greater involvement from DOE in the labs, what would be the most beneficial way to think about lab to market and incubation and acceleration in this space? Want to go first? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So um, we, we were part of Cyclotron Road, and um, it was you know, pretty instrumental in getting us off the ground. Um, I think. Um, Probably pretty safe to say we, you know, we wouldn't be where we are now with, without them. And because not only do we get like free rent, which is huge in the Bay, um, for the for the two or three years we we've been there, but we also got mentorship and um, got funding. I mean, it, it, none of the funding came directly to the company; it came to us through salary support, and we were able to bring my team. Um, but just even just the the history and all the all the scientists that are currently there at the labs was a huge draw in attracting top talent to be able to be housed at the lab. So it's, it was a really valuable program. Um, and I think, yeah, I'd love to see more of those. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you look back in our, in our history in America, like, you know, the labs came out of the World War II effort, and it was just this ecosystem of all these top scientists. And, that, and, and bringing people together like that um, can really accelerate innovation and accelerate kind of new thought processes and new technologies. You know, we, we used to have Bell Labs and these other sort of corporate labs, and those are, those are kind of like corporate R&D efforts that t seem to be declining. And so, um, you know, relying again on these, these national labs, these sort of these gems that we have, I think can really be huge in bringing about new technology. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can't, can't say enough about them. I think, I think they're great. You know, I would just add that they're absolutely critical. So when I built my company 25 years ago out of my garage, literally my garage, I was begging and borrowing for bits and pieces to the, build the next pilot scale. Very expensive money, my own money, investor money, very expensive, very painful money. Had to hire you know, my own staff, had to search high and low for experts. And what I see the Cyclotron Roads of the, do, uh, of the world doing, and, and we've invested in two companies that were incubated out of Cyclotron Road, I'm a huge fan of the Cyclotron Road model, um, is that they provide a lot of that space for two years. It's a safe space, you're hanging out with Nobel laureates, world-class scientists, they're just, you know, the building down the, the road from you, access to world-class equipment that I had to beg, borrow, and steal for, you know, you know, electron microscopes, you name it, right? So that first two years, they're in a housing that, that's, just fantastic, besides getting a little bit of money so they can survive, but it's those resources that are absolutely critical. So I, I was so glad to see that Oak Ridge and, and uh, Argonne are duplicating that sort of model. Uh, any accelerators along those lines, throw, please throw money at Matt and Noah on that carbon, <laughs> carbon labs, please. <laughs> we need those. So we go early stage, but we see companies 
we often see, in, when we, in particular when we create the two companies I mentioned about, and we're looking to create more, they have no, most technologists, which is where companies usually start, have no idea what a company's about, right? So we have to spend a huge amount of time coaching them on what it takes to build, to build a company. What, what does a company look like? What does it feel like? What are the resources I need to build the back office? You know, all those things. And the incubators play that role as well because they share ideas among each other and they share resources and, and you know, legal and, and accounting and all, all those things that just drive an entrepreneur nuts and they do horribly at, uh, are also they get from that ecosystem. There are so many value adds. That money is leveraged so many times over in those incubators. In fact, I'm sure I know Elon, it, 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 Cyclotron Road does calculations on how much the money gets leveraged. It, it, it's real, I know, as a for a fact. So any of you uh, that have the ability to support incubators, please do. They're, they're vital. That's the, to me, that's like the first step. And we actually push companies to, to find local incubators if we feel like they need that whole, how do I build a business expertise and they need access to those, those human and, and uh, equipment resources. So we have less than a minute left and I have one wrap up question. It's a very quick one. It's another one thing question, um, which is what is one thing that the people in this room can do uh, to help uh, enable the success of this emerging industry? I'm going to start with Mike because I know he has an answer. <laughs> he told me earlier. My answer is a little long. And we'll just go down the, down the row and we have 19 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can, I, I, won't, I can't do it in 19 seconds, believe it's impossible, so give us a little bit more time, is that okay? Of course, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I do this at the end of my talks, particularly when I'm talking to entrepreneurs at universities, I talk about what can you do, because I think it's so important, so I'm glad you, you asked this question. So we, we normally think, who's gonna solve this problem for us? You start with government, you think next big business, then maybe you think small and medium enterprises, then you think individuals, sort of in that order, right? And individuals can't do anything, small and medium enterprises don't have the resources, so we really look towards the top two. Well, just really quickly, let me tell you an analysis I did on those, those three. So, I'm gonna reel back up, I'm not gonna go there, that's too complicated, painful. So, big business. So Coca-Cola, Unilever, two companies that have talked about how they've reduced carbon and they've done a fantastic job. Unilever, a billion, is it a billion tons, I think it is, over a seven year time period. Uh, oh my God, that's huge. Why don't more companies do that? Coca-Cola, similarly. And then I started figuring out, I need to normalize this so I figure out what that impact is. So I'll just say I normalized it per year per employee. It came out to be one ton of CO2 per employee for Unilever, two tons of CO2 per year for Coca-Cola. Not bad, but now it doesn't sound so impressive as a billion tons, right? So uh, I then said, well, what, what kind of small medium enterprise is? can do. So we did an LCA in my, my company. We, we picked our Austrian plant. Long story short, came out 300 tons per year per employee. So my message to you is support the companies that are being incubated in this system because they're the ones that are gonna, gonna drive change. When you build a company from ground up, it's all about being resource efficient and doing things in a way that's low carbon intensity that can drive impact dramatically. I also have a what you, what you can do on an individual level, but I, I don't want to steal any more time than that, so. I think Brad's already given me the evil eye, but let, let's very quickly, <laughs> anyone else has a, a suggestion? I, I think it is important to kind of think about when you're at a conference like this, you know, you're involved in this space or you want to be involved, you know, what, what can you do? So any, any other suggestions? Um, I mean, you know, we, we open sourced our approach for a reason. So you can actually get on the Interface website, you can download the Climate Take Back Plan, and, if you're ever in a conversation with a company or an institution who's like, I don't know if I have the right targets or we don't really know how to navigate the level of ambition that we need to set the right target, it's a great sort of example to be like, actually, here's a company who's built a plan. Um, they got their CEO to sign off on it. They're making investments. And one thing we have learned is there are people in the room who heard about my company solely because 20 years ago, we had a CEO who stood up and told this story. And the power of saying to other companies, we did it, it's good for business, it's possible, you cannot underestimate that. I mean, when our founder died, uh, Richard Branson called me and it was one of 15 phone calls I got the day the news broke that he died and they said, you guys made us believe it was possible. And we've all said, we need to make people believe this is possible. So share what you've learned here and make people believe it's possible. Yeah, and Ray was one of my inspirations too, by the way. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I think that's it, spread the word.
I'll go with that too in the interest of time. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh,